Maybe you've been exploring the fringes of Christianity or came across a video on YouTube that mentioned it. Or maybe you simply looked into it while reading a book or listening to a podcast. Or maybe you're a college bro and it came up in one of your lectures. And now, after having a brief run-in with it, you have to ask, what is Gnosticism? It means to know God, but to know what? Well, I guess I could answer that with a brief introduction to Gnostic mythology with some quotes from the Nag Hammadi, explain the monad, or the formation of the Catholic Church, maybe explain the fundamental difference between traditional Christians and Gnostic beliefs, and I will. But why do you care about Gnosticism? Why do you care about what it is? It's a serious question. Why would there be a sudden interest in a practice that mostly disappeared from the earth about 2,000 years ago? Or what if you haven't heard of Gnosticism, and some religiously spurgy stranger just had to bring it up, and now you want to know what the hell he's talking about? What is Gnosticism? At some point, we've all had moments of laying in bed, depressed, inactive, diving in and out of dots in moments in life, and telling ourselves, surely there is more to life than this. Do you go to work? and have thoughts about all the great things you could be doing other than being some robot wage worker for some fat, nasty, wannabe capitalistic supervisor? Do you sit in your new car and wonder to yourself why this car no longer makes you happy? Or why your new apartment didn't quite make you feel as sheltered as you should be? Or why no matter how much shit you buy from Amazon you just aren't so satisfied with life as you should be. Did you get a new job with a higher salary? Then come to a feeling that you are no better off inside than you were before? You see, inside us all, whether you're some normal fag who watches Netflix and supports LGBT rights and Black Lives Matter, or a pastor at a bigoted Baptist church who has a Gadsden flag hanging from his porch, or somewhere in between, we experience a familiar scenario of I don't have enough because what I have doesn't make me happy. And it's at this point most of us decide that the solution is to simply buy more stuff or make career changes so we can afford to buy more stuff. And then this becomes the story of our life until we die. But maybe you realize that the solution wouldn't fill that emptiness. However, logically, that doesn't make sense. I mean, if I don't have enough, then clearly the solution is more, right? We Gnostics have a word for people who think this way. We call them hylix, or materialists. They are people who can only see value among physical abundance, or even people as physical things people who prioritize physical properties before anything else. Gnostics are very critical of such thinking. So, when asking what is Gnosticism, it's best to first explain what we are not. And we are not materialist, hylix. We do not see the physical human needs and desires as things needing to be addressed and catered to in order to find fulfillment. We see the physical world as a trap and a simulation, and the human body as a mere avatar, or vehicle, which has the ability to process and experience the occurrences of the physical world and its effects on us as individuals. But if life is merely an experience within a simulation, then who created it, and why? In the beginning there was God, and by God I mean the One, the All, later known as Monad. This is not the creator god who made the earth as explained in Genesis, but something far greater before Genesis. In the Gnostic scripture found in the Nag Hammadi's The Secret Book of John, it explains, the one is the invisible spirit. We should not think of it as a god or like a god, for it is greater than a god because it has nothing over it and no lord above it. 
It does not exist within anything inferior to it, since everything exists within it alone. It is eternal, since it does not need anything, for it is absolutely complete. It has never lacked anything in order to be completed by it. Rather, it is always absolutely complete in light. The One is illimitable, since there is nothing before it to limit it. Unfathomable, since there is nothing before it to fathom it. Immeasurable, since there was nothing before it to measure it. Invisible, since nothing has seen it. Eternal, since it exists eternally. Unutterable, since nothing could comprehend it to utter it. Unnameable, because there is nothing before it to give it a name. The One is immeasurable light, pure, holy, immaculate. The One is unutterable and is perfect in incorruptibility. Not that it is a part of perfection or blessings or divinity, it is much greater. The One is not corporeal and it is not incorporeal. The One is not large and is not small. It is impossible to say how much is it, what kind is it, for no one can understand it. The One is not among the things that exist, but it is much greater. Not that it is greater, rather, as it is in itself, it is not a part of the eternal realms or of time. For whatever is part of a realm was once prepared by another. Time was not allotted to it, since it received nothing from anyone. What would be received would be on loan. The one who is first does not need to receive anything from another. Such a one beholds itself in its light. The one is majestic and has an immeasurable purity. The one is a realm that gives a realm, life that gives life, a blessed one that gives blessedness, knowledge that gives knowledge, a good one that gives goodness, mercy that gives mercy and redemption, grace that gives grace. Not as if the one possesses all of this, rather, it is that the one gives immeasurable and incomprehensible light. What shall I tell you about it? Its eternal realm is incorruptible, at peace, dwelling in silence, at rest before everything. It is the head of all realms, and it sustains them through its goodness. We would not know what is ineffable. We would not understand what is immeasurable, were it not for what has come from the Father. This is the one who has told these things to us alone. This is the God of the Gnostics, who is in fact greater than what's to be called a God. So then, who is the creator God of the Bible? The Yahweh, or Elohim, Jehovah, and so on. Is he the son of the one? Well, we haven't quite gone on to who the creator God is. He is so low in the ranks, it might be quite some time before we get to him. So now that I've established the one and the all, let us move down the rabbit hole of the Gnostic creation mythology and talk about Barbello. The secret book of John continues. Now, this father is the one who beholds himself in the light surrounding him, which is the spring of living water, and provides all the realms. It reflects on his image everywhere, sees it in the spring of the spirit, and becomes enamored of the luminous water for his image is in the spring of pure luminous water surrounding him. The Father's thought became a reality, and she who appeared in his presence of the Father in shining light came forth. She is the first power who preceded everything, and came forth from the Father's mind as the forethought of all. Her light shines like the Father's light. She, the perfect power, is the image of the perfect and invisible Virgin Spirit. She, the first power, the glory of Barbello, the perfect glory among the realms, the glory of revelation. She glorified and praised the Virgin Spirit, for because of the Spirit, she had come forth. She is the first thought, the image of the Spirit. She became the universal womb, for she perceives everything. The mother, father, the first human, the Holy Spirit, the triple male, the triple power, the androgynous one with three names, 
the eternal realm among the invisible things, the first to come forth. Barbello asked the invisible virgin spirit to give her foreknowledge, and the spirit consented. When the spirit consented, foreknowledge appeared and stood by forethought. This is the one who came from the thought of the invisible virgin spirit. Foreknowledge glorified the spirit and the spirit's perfect power. Barbello, for because of her foreknowledge, had come into being. She asked again to be given incorruptibility, and the spirit consented. When the spirit consented, incorruptibility appeared and stood by thought and foreknowledge. Incorruptibility glorified the invisible one in Barbello. Because of her, they had come into being. Barbello asked to be given life eternal, and the invisible spirit consented. When the spirit consented, life eternal appeared, and they stood together and glorified the invisible spirit in Barbello. Because of her, they had come into being. She asked again to be given truth, and the invisible spirit consented. Truth appeared, and they stood together and glorified the good invisible spirit and its Barbello. Because of her, they had come into being. This is the Father's realm of five. It is the first human, the image of the invisible spirit, that is, forethought, which is Barbello and thought along with foreknowledge, incorruptibility, life eternal, truth. This is the androgynous realm of five, which is the realm of ten, which is the father. Simply, the one looked into the waters and his light reflected into them, creating a female who is Barbello. And as the one did this, virtues came along with his light and were established into the reflection Barbello. So, where is the Creator God? Is it Barbello? Nope, sorry. We've got a long way to go before we get there. Let me read on further into the book, and let's talk about the child of Barbello. The father gazed into Barbello, with the pure light surrounding the invisible spirit and its radiance. Barbello conceived from it, and it produced a spark of light similar to the blessed light, but not as great. This was the only child of the mother-father that had come forth, its only offspring, the only child of the father, the pure light. The invisible virgin spirit rejoiced over the light that was produced and came forth first from its first power of the spirit's forethought, who is Barbello. The spirit anointed it with its own goodness until it was perfect, with no lack of goodness, since it was anointed with the goodness of the invisible spirit. The child stood in the presence of the spirit as the spirit anointed the child. When the child received this from the spirit, at once it glorified the Holy Spirit and perfect for that. Because of her, it had come forth. The child has to be given mind as a companion to work with, and the spirit consented. When the invisible spirit consented, mind appeared and stood by the anointed, and glorified the spirit and Barbello. All these things came into existence in silence. Mind wished to create something by means of the word of the invisible spirit. Its will became a reality and appeared, with mind and the light glorifying it. Word followed will. For the anointed, the self-conceived God, created everything by the word. Life eternal, will, mind, and foreknowledge stood together and glorified the invisible spirit and Barbello, for because of her they had come into being. The Holy Spirit brought the self-conceived divine child of itself and Barbello to perfection, so that the child might stand before the great invisible virgin spirit as the self-conceived God, the anointed, who honored the spirit with loud acclaim. The child came forth through forethought. The invisible spirit set the true, self-conceived God over everything and caused all authority and the truth within to be subject to it so that the child might understand everything, the one called by a name greater than every name, for that name will be told to those who are worthy of it. This child of Barbello is important in regards to the following scriptures because this child is who created a realm 
that is where our own existence persists. It's at this point we almost get to meet the Creator God, so let us move on to the four luminaries the child created. Now, from the light, which is the anointed, and from incorruptibility by the grace of the Spirit, the four luminaries that derive from the self-conceived God gazed out in order to stand before it. The three beings are will, thought, life. The four powers are understanding, grace, perception, thoughtfulness. Grace dwells in the eternal realm of the luminary Harmazel, who is the first angel. There are three other realms with this eternal realm. Grace, truth, form. The second luminary is Orael, who has been appointed over the second eternal realm. There are three other realms with it. After that, perception, memory. The third luminary is Devathai, who has been appointed over the third realm. There are three realms with it, understanding, love, idea. The fourth eternal realm has been set up for the fourth luminary, Elilith. There are three other realms with it, perfection, peace, Sophia. These are the four luminaries that stand before the self-conceived God. These are the twelve eternal realms that stand before the child of the great conceived the anointed, by the will and grace of the invisible spirit. The twelve realms belong to the child of the self-conceived, and everything was established by the will of the Holy Spirit through the self-conceived one. For the sake of time and simplicity, we'll focus on the last mention of these realms, Sophia, or Wisdom. What makes wisdom so relevant to us and our shit world is that wisdom is an experience in which the person gaining this wisdom endures not only positive experience, but also negative ones. Mistakes, accidents, miscalculations, failure, ignorance, doing without knowing resulting in consequence, and then moving on to know better with experience. As we read, we follow Sophia as she goes on to make such a great mistake, resulting in the birth of what we know as the Creator God. Now, Sophia, who is the wisdom of afterthought and who constitutes an eternal realm, conceived of a thought for herself. With the conception of the invisible spirit and foreknowledge, she wanted to bring forth something like herself without the consent of the spirit who had not given approval without her partner and without his consideration. The male did not give approval. She did not find her partner, and she considered this without the spirit's consent and without the knowledge of her partner. Nonetheless, she gave birth, and because of the invincible power within her, her thought was not an idle thought. Something came out of her that was imperfect and different in appearance from her or she had produced it without her partner. It did not resemble its mother and was misshapen. When Sophia saw what her desire had produced, it changed into the figure of a snake with the face of a lion. Its eyes were like flashing bolts of lightning. She cast it away from her, outside that realm, so that none of the immortals would see it. She had produced it ignorantly. She surrounded it with a bright cloud and put a throne in the middle of the cloud so that no one would see it except the Holy Spirit, who is called the mother of the living. She named her offspring Yaldabaoth. Now, there's a lot more to the story about the repentance of Sophia, the spirits from the other realms coming into ours, and even one of Yaldabaoth's henchmen abandoning his reign and joining Sophia later on. But let's keep this easy to understand. The simplest way to describe Gnostic mythology is the one all, Barbello, the anointed child, Sophia, then the creator god, Yaldabaoth. We Gnostics believe that the all one is the highest god, so high he can't even be called a god. And the other Christians believe that the highest god is the biblical creator god who we call Yaldabaoth. Throughout Gnostic scriptures, Yaldabaoth continuously created this universe making error after error, from the creation of his angels, even to the creation of Adam. 
Everything is done through continuous arrogance for the sake of convincing everyone, including himself, that he is the highest god. Regardless, we, the offspring of Adam, were given a light from the higher realms at the time of the creation of Adam. Kept inside our flesh cages where the legions of Yaldabaoth, the Archons, try to keep us trapped in this realm under their rule. From our bodies to the environment and the material desires and even the mainstream religions, they are all layers of captivity designed by the Archons to trap this light from returning to the higher realms. To believe differently is what makes you a high light. It is through the teachings of Gnosticism, which comes through Christ, that we learn how to break through captivity. And it's through the Gnostic scriptures we learn that it is a great lie that Christ is the son of the creator god Yeldabaoth. While there might be different interpretations and greater details found throughout the Nag Hammadi, what I describe to you is the fundamental beliefs of Gnosticism from the formation of the Roman Catholics all the way into the American Bible Belt. The early Christian beliefs, Gnosticism, the truth, have all been well hidden from us. The Christians have been taught to read strictly from the canon, a book well crafted with carefully picked scriptures used to enforce a state religion that has existed for nearly 2,000 years. These scriptures were chosen specifically to match the Jewish Tanakh for the sake of promoting prophecies which justify a new world order, the ultimate goal of the Archons, in which they can ensure humanity remains trapped in this realm, never again attempting to rejoin their individual light with the One, forever keeping our light for the benefit of Yaldabaoth's reign. So, do you want to be trapped here with Hylix? and be reincarnated over and over again, only to live in the servitude of a retard creator god? Would you like to live every day of your life asking what your purpose is, only to wake up stuck in a cycle of work, sleep, jacking off, and repeating until you die, then get to do it all again in the next lifetime? Does drinking yourself to sleep every night or getting prescription antidepressants get old and you want to kill yourself? Well, don't kill yourself. Not because I think you have purpose and all that other shit, but just know you're gonna end up right back here again if you do. Just trying to save you some effort. If you really want to make a change, I, Ryu of the Abandoned Sons of Adam, suggest you take some time and internet search the Nag Hammadi. Maybe reread the secret book of John I just presented to you, and take a look at the rest of the story of our journey into creation. Learn how to get the hell out of this mess. Thank you for watching The Abandoned Sons of Adam, and thanks for not being a Hylic.